Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Eating Disorder Hope webinar presentation. We're so glad that you took your time to join us today on our presentation on treatment for men with eating disorders, featuring our special guest, Dr. Kim McCallum, who is the medical director and founder of McCallum Place. And before we get started, I just wanted to point out a couple things if you're joining us as an attendee today. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to Dr. McCallum on her presentation. And you can submit questions at any point during her presentation via the question pane of your control panel. So feel free to submit questions through your control panel. I will be receiving those, moderating them, and we will be asking these questions to Dr. McCallum at the end of her presentation. So I will now be trans transitioning this over to Dr. McCallum. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Crystal, and thanks for joining us, everyone. So it has been about 25 years that I started working with men with eating disorders and seeing men come into treatment. And although we've come a long way, there are still many barriers to identifying um, eating disorders in men. Uh, if you talk to anyone uh, who's male and struggling now, they'll talk about how uncomfortable it was initially um, talking about their symptoms. And there's still a lot of stigma, I think, and I think it's much harder for men to uh, and boys to report what they might be feeling and thinking. Uh, also, another point is many of our screening tools may not identify all the male patients who may be suffering due to a different um, or a lack of sensitivity for the types of uh, body image issues that they might have and different perception of binges uh, that young males might have. And so, uh, Screening tools have been uh, modified somewhat, but I think we can do a little bit better going forward in the future. We'll talk about a couple of different tools. I think most people uh, are using in a clinical setting the EDQ, uh, uh, the EDI, and the uh, uh, FC is a, a newer one that I think is, is really good for identifying some of the exercise and body image issues. And, uh, uh, other aspects maybe that are more sensitive to the what males are experiencing. The other thing that I think is really a big deal is that fewer cases are identified when they seek help um, and that probably due to a lack of familiarity of the professional community in terms of recognizing signs, eating disorders and medical complications in males. Uh, recently uh, I've had a handful of patients who told me that they still heard from their uh, primary care doc or their initial therapist that eating disorders only occurred in women. So we have some work still in getting the word out. Um, the other thing is, is that anorexia and restrictive type eating disorders may be missed because uh, some muscular men have weight suppression but they may still have a normal BMI, and so the, the degree of malnutrition may be miscalculated, misunderstood, and we'll come back to that. So in general, um, there are many barriers to identifying eating disorders in men still, and that, as you can imagine, makes it hard to assess the prevalence of eating disorders in men. I'm having trouble moving this forward. Let me see. I got it. So the studies that do estimate the prevalence in males um, uh, are now coming in with a lifetime prevalence of 0.3% in anorexia, 0.5% in bulimia nervosa, and 0.8-2% to of uh, binge eating disorders. ARFID still is unclear. We'll come back to ARFID a little bit later. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that the new DSM criteria have uh, modified, have been modified, so there's a lower threshold, and so it's only been in the past year or so that um, 
we've been more able to accurately identify uh, anorexia in males. And so many of the studies were uh, done using the DSM-4 criteria. Uh, in a population person uh, survey, or a population, it's a survey study in the community, again, you do four criteria, males represented roughly 25% of those meeting criteria for anorexia and bulimia and approximately 36% of those uh, with binge eating disorder. And this is uh, markedly different than what we used to uh, say, which was that eating disorders in males represented about 10% of the cases. Uh, now that we um, have been more systematic and looking at eating disorders in males, I think we're getting close to understanding the true picture. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? You're breaking on up quite a bit on my end. Am I? Do you, do you want me to call in on the phone? Or? I think that oh, might help. We can figure out a mute your computer and then go ahead and call in. It's just a little bit difficult to understand. Okay. Well, um, we're going to try that right now. Okay, we'll, we'll stay on the line and, and wait till you get connected. Do you want me to uh, continue with this slide and then what, while we're calling in? Um, you can go ahead and call in, Dr. McCallum. We can wait. Okay. I bet there's some weather interfering with this. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, you might just want to mute your computer if you're able to do that. And I think we should be good. How about now? Yes, that works great. That Thank great. you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, a, a, another interesting report uh, by Eisenberg showed that approximately 3% of students cre screening for an eating disorder um, were, um, hold on, he's having tech problems here. Okay, 3.6% of students screening positive for an eating disorder were, were uh, males. So it was roughly a 3 to 1 ratio of females to males. So that's consistent with this idea that, you know, somewhere in, uh, in between 20 and 30% of the cases now are uh, presenting in males. Uh, and in adolescent boys, we know that uh, the prevalence of eating disorders increases uh, between the ages of 14 and 20, just like it does in females. And again, remember in adolescence, uh, the control of food and, um, uh, you know, per the control of food is partly under uh, parental control. And so uh, it's not unusual, particularly in uh, binge eating disorder, to see that evidence or the prevalence increase. So I want to say a word about stigma because stigma is a mechanism which um, perhaps increases both the uh, depression in this population and puts kids at risk for eating disorders. So many of the young men who come into treatment report having been bullied for either non-gender conforming behavior or appearance or sexual preferences. Uh, some of the kids are, were at higher weight um, and when they were younger experienced some kind of weight related shaming and in fact that's very common in kids and it's one of the most frequent types of bullying that we see in um, uh, early school age children. And then others find it hard to, to um, uh, get help. There's a 
limited access to treatment programs uh, in the past that except men. I think uh, more and more are uh, uh, educating their staff and developing the skills to be able to to provide good care for men. But uh, uh, we have been pro providing partial hospital residential treatment uh, now for uh, quite a while, and many men have to travel out of state to uh, get any kind of intensive treatment. So the typical onset for males is very similar to females. Uh, uh, the vulnerability of a perfectionistic personality and a shy temperament uh, may increase risk. Uh, males, uh, remember males in general, uh, not always, but in general, might have more difficulty uh, talking about emotion and processing emotion, uh, and uh, uh, so it, it can be very complicated and difficult initially because of this this shyness and this trouble with emotional awareness, especially in young men, to to uh, process emotional stress, and this may put them at greater risk. Restrictive eating may start as an attempt to eat healthy. Um, in boys and men, and many of our our patients will talk about their fathers maybe having problems with uh, coronary artery disease or hypertension or with weight, and they may be uh, imitating their parents uh, initially or, or concerned about developing health problems. Uh, but others were, are uh, developing restrictive eating to avoid body shaming or teasing about body's size, shape, or weight. The um, third thing that is also true for both women uh, and girls as well as males uh, is this risk of low available energy. And uh, many boys are involved in sport and low available energy can emerge in the context of training for sport without adjusting the nutrition. This is particularly true in um, young boys who are uh, training in elite sport. Uh, Many of the uh, dietitians uh, or, or many of the coaches are not really aware of what their nutritional needs would be. I'm having trouble here with the. They, they can't see my webinar. Wow. I haven't had these kinds of tech problems. Can you see that now? No, are you still in the GoToWebinar page where you can see the right on the right-hand side, the <laughs> phone number and the panelist chat? And if can not, you we see can it? continue with voice. Oh, not right. yet, uh, but we can, we can continue with voice and I can email out the PowerPoint if that, I don't want to derail you, it's, it's great information. Okay. Um, well, I apologize for the tech problems here. Um, so, uh, body image. Uh, so, the male ideal is different um, than the female ideal. So, currently, most males talk about um, uh, idealizing a lean and muscular body. And the drive for thinness is less of a factor for many men and in fact they might actually want increased muscle tone. Now others might uh, conversely um, uh, really want to pursue extreme muscularity and then there's another set of males who really do uh, like women or most young girls with eating disorders want to pursue thinness. So there's a broad range of um, uh, body types that our patients are pursuing. And the body type may be emphasized, a certain body type might be emphasized in a certain subculture leading to more distress and to dissatisfaction. Like sports, like distance running may encourage a very lean body type. And uh, football might emphasize bulk, bulking up. And uh, young men in gay communities may feel like there are extra pressures uh, uh, to uh, pursue the a lean muscularity type. So there's uh, subcultural uh, 
modifications that you want to think about in working with males. And it's really important to explore what their body ideal is and what kind of pressures there might be in their um, sport or in their community. Restrictive eating in males, uh, I wish I could pull up this slide for you, um, but you will get it. Uh, I'm, uh, you see in both anorexia and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And so most of the males receiving what I call high intensity dose treatment, which is partial hospital or residential care, are um, struggling with anorexia and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So even though they're less prevalent, um, they tend to be harder to treat in an outpatient setting. Uh, endocrine suppression is also a concern in males as, the, as it is in females. For males, you'll see in particular growth suppression, depression, and low testosterone levels, as well as some bone effects. We'll come back to that. Uh, it's not as easy to identify the degree of weight suppression or to follow or to set weight targets. And similar degrees of weight loss and malnutrition are found between the groups of anorexia and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So our FID is distinguished because of the difference in focus on body image and really um, not on the degree of weight suppression, malnutrition, or, or food fears. Uh, so uh, patients with anorexia will show much more body dissatisfaction, body image distortion, weight and shape concerns, and again, be more focused on lean muscularity and sometimes also on achieving low weight. While RFID patients are reporting greater fears of vomiting or choking, um, we are seeing many more with severe early onset anxiety disorder predating the eating disorder, those with uh, food and texture problems and sensory integration problems, as well as a greater dependency on nutritional sub supplements at intake in our RFID patients. Let's shift to bulimia and binge eating disorder. Um, it's interesting in um, population study, when you look at the incidence of binge eating in males, there's really no difference in the prevalence of subclinical binge eating disorder. So the early symptoms are, are common across gender. Uh, habitual binge eating typically starts at around age 11, and the risk increases um, uh, with the average age of onset of the syndromes of bulimia and binge eating between ages of 12 and 13. Uh, there is an increased risk of high, high weight um, uh, African American and Hispanic youth developing binge eating, uh, both binge eating disorders and bulimia. So that's important to identify in those particular subgroups uh, because binge eating disorder can actually complicate high weight and lead to greater obesity in later adolescence and adulthood. Uh, Hispanic and African American um, populations are underserved in general in terms of eating disorder recognition and treatment, and, and, and males may be actually at greater risk. Uh, <clears throat> males are also more prone to use binge eating as a coping mechanism and have a binge craving response to restriction more than males, and this, this comes from a Swanson uh, uh, study looking at the uh, cognitive therapy with males with uh, binge eating and bulimia, that uh, uh, we know that many binge eat as a, as a response to stress, and males may be even more prone to this. Uh, purging and unbalanced exercise. So. Um, Males are just as likely as females to use laxatives or diuretics or uh, to vomit. And, um, but they also may be more prone to excessive unbalanced exercise, particularly that includes bodybuilding, weightlifting, and muscle toning. Compulsive physical training may be associated with managing distress related to binges or body dissatisfaction. And some may show signs of muscle dysmorphia, purging supplements, um, purging using supplements, 
vomiting and diuretics are, are very commonly used by muscle builders or um, uh, it, because what it does is it increases that physical, visible muscle definition and uh, in people who enter bodybuilding contests they will tell you that um, uh, beforehand they will uh, purge to try to increase the, the uh, definition uh, so that they'll get higher scores. Uh, men uh, also can be engaged in frequent weighing and frequent body checking and that would become an important focus for treatment because both maintain the uh, negative attitudes about their body size, shape and weight and drive dieting and purging behavior. Uh, many men tell me that before they came to treatment, although they might have um, had their eating disorder identified uh, by their primary care doc and they might have been referred to a psychotherapist. They uh, struggled with hypotension, bradycardia, fainting, dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, uh, or, and reflux, constipation, uh, and really had no ev medical evaluation. So um, uh, it's important to remember that males are just as prone, if not more prone, to medical complications as, as females. And it's important that a, a thorough, comprehensive assessment be completed early on. Uh, so cardiovascular symptoms that are common, particularly in severe eating disorders in males, include hypotension, bradycardia, and fainting. Uh, and then uh, purging can lead to electrolyte abnormalities and dehydration. Uh, reflux, reflux and constipation are uh, related to um, the malnutrition and the purging. Uh, superior mesenteric artery syndrome has been seen in many um, uh, who have uh, had rapid weight loss. And it's been, I've had four or five cases of men, this could be life-threatening and um, uh, is very acute and requires hospitalization on a medical unit. Uh, uh, bowel rest and so it's, it's very important to um, think about superior mesenteric artery syndrome in young males who have had rapid weight loss and uh, spontaneous vomiting and abdominal pain. Uh, many also underestimate the degree of endocrine suppression that males are experiencing. Uh, testosterone um, levels can be very low and there's um, growth suppression uh, that many of the males are seeing uh, and so uh, it's important to look at the growth curves and to make sure that uh, growth is not significantly lower than expected. Bone fractures, osteopenia and osteoporosis are also common and uh, uh, DEXA scans should be considered in anyone who has uh, testosterone uh, suppression or has had sig significant weight loss. The medical complications associated with obesity are um, another very important concern. Uh, there are joint problems, uh, esophageal reflux disease, fatty liver, gallstone problems, asthma, uh, low vitamin D and low testosterone can also be seen in high weight patients, so low testosterone and low vitamin D are not simply related to weight suppression. Uh, uh, we have had, in, with our very high weight binge eating children who have needed intensive treatment, uh, many come in with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and even sleep apnea uh, at night. And of course, there is an increased risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. So in a very high weight young person with, with binge eating disorder, medical complications are very important to consider and uh, psychological treatment, actively addressing the binge eating is a, a key part of that treatment. 
you can't see this slide, but it really shows the different faces and body types of those struggling with eating disorders. And, you know, just to remind everyone that you can have very high weight and very low weight or even be at a normal weight but be restrictive for your body size and shape or you can have a very different kind of body composition and all can represent weight and body related um, manifestations of an eating disorder. So um, adolescence. Uh, I have a couple of adolescent cases I want to mention that will illuminate some of the different things that we might see in eating disorders in, in the teenagers. Um, we had a 16-year-old male who came to treatment at, um, who had been at the 40th percentile for weight prior to the eating disorder, and um, but now has gross suppression of six inches, uh, having stopped growing at age 11. Uh, at the same time, he had started to run distance uh, with the cross-country team at school and developed increasingly more rigid eating uh, and uh, stomach aches and body image concerns and presented with uh, uh, also with bradycardia. And uh, it was of note that prior to um, multiple endocrine, or prior to coming to eating disorders treatment, he had had multiple endocrine evaluations and even a trial of growth hormone. Uh, and then we had a 17-year-old male with bulimia, binge eating, and purging behavior, compulsive weight training in the context of being bullied at school around his non-gender conforming behavior, uh, leading to multiple um, electrolyte abnormalities and fainting, but also uh, to extreme psychological distress and suicidal thinking. And then a 14-year-old with um, OSFED with some weight loss and a BMI of 22, but that BMI of 22 was associated with bradycardia and vomiting, restrictive, uh, or bradycardia and um, restrictive eating and vomiting and, and uh, 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 and, and inflexibility around uh, food. And his uh, eating disorder occurred after a concussion, which um, uh, led to both depression and uh, an inability to return to sport. And the loss of his sport uh, precipitated the eating disorder. And his doctor um, had a hard time figuring out what his appropriate weight should be. Certainly, even after stopping his sport, his his weight was uh, depressed and he was bradycardic. Um, uh, yet, it was complicated how to how to uh, figure out what the right weight would be. Uh, and then a 15-year-old male with a 10-year history of being extremely overweight was also struggling with food hoarding and other signs of frequent binge eating. Uh, at five foot nine, at 100 and, or at 496 pounds, he had gained 150 pounds in the past year with hypertension and uh, dyslipidemia and obstructive sleep apnea. So those cases represent some of the range of what we would see in an intensive treatment, and. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to draw our attention again to the teen athletes who are at such risk for increased negative energy balance associated with sport. And uh, this negative energy uh, balance is very common, like I said, in teenagers uh, who have variable growth and activity demands and a lot of social comparisons and at the same time increasing independence around meals. And this is a, the low energy, um, meaning less energy coming in than is needed to perform and uh, move your body and to heal and repair, uh, is the pathway towards medical complications, but also will worsen the eating disorder mindset. So it's really important, especially with young athletes, that athletes be redshirted until a full evaluation is complete, full medical evaluation, and nutrition is established. Um, 
Certain sports cultures put the athletes at more risk, such as athletes or sports that emphasize appearance, weight requirements, um, or sport, or uh, uh, sports that emphasize muscularity, like bodybuilding, or gymnastics, diving, jockeys, rowing, or wrestling uh, are higher risk for men. Um, also, we know that when there is an emphasis on the individual rather than the entire team, particularly for males um, who can become very isolated, uh, that will put the athlete at risk. Um, that's perhaps more true for runners, gymnasts, climbers, and divers. And then um, certainly those involved in endurance sports may have more trouble calculating um, the appropriate amount of energy. Uh, other factors would be uh, the belief that lower body weight would improve performance, which actually isn't true for most sports. And the um, uh, problem with injury uh, and the stress related to the loss of ability to play can make the athlete feel uh, a huge sense of loss and disappointment and uh, confusion about their sport identity. And that also can precipitate eating disorders behavior as a coping mechanism. I just wanted to point out that 8% of athletes with eating disorders, um, or 8% of uh, male athletes have eating disorders versus 0.5% um, uh, of those who are not. So there is definitely an increased risk. Um, coming back to uh, the teens and how poor nutrition can affect growth, we know that a change in height um, and weight occurs during the ages of 11 to 16 for boys of 14 inches and 50 to 60 pounds. And in that, males show lots of variability in the time of growth and the rate of growth. We know that males are vulnerable to growth suppression if um, weight loss and restriction are significant. And growth curves are really the gold standard for setting goals for weight restoration in teens, and in particular for males. Uh, we know that um, uh, if their growth is suppressed, you want to make sure that you are setting a weight based on the trajectory for what their height should have been. Uh, uh, and a failure to do that might actually um, mistakenly put you in a place where the, the young man or young male will not grow. Uh, eating disorders in the gay, bisexual, and trans population are um, gaining more attention. Um, remember that eating disorders emerge at this time fraught with the risk of depression due to the complexity and anxiety around coming out. And uh, that's hard enough. Uh, and although uh, Homosexual, it's important to remember, though, that although homosexual males have a significantly increased risk over heterosexual males, most cases still are seen in heterosexual males. Uh, homosexual and trans boys uh, and men may in part show an increased risk of the binge perch type uh, eating disorders due to an increased incidence of sexual trauma and the bullying effect of uh, body image on uh, security and self-regulation. Um, that increased risk is true, of course, with females. And then um, transsexual females to males and males to females may restrict to suppress the body changes associated or related to est estrogen um, in particular if they're not already on endocrine suppressing agents. And uh, the current stats say that um, uh, transsexuals are four times more likely to develop eating disorders. So it's particularly uh, a, it's a particularly high risk group. Actually, is also that actually is also true for the gender queer um, kids and adults. I want to. Spend a minute talking a little bit about the some adult cases um, uh, to give you a sense of the scope uh, that we're seeing. Uh, we had a 20-year-old football player at a D1 college who presented 
with binge eating disorder, but also um, alternated that those big binges with restriction and res uh, restriction of fluids, had um, medical complications, increasing anxiety and depression and uh, extreme body dissatisfaction. He had been an overweight child um, and uh, it was very important for him to come into intensive treatment to be able to make change. And then a 30-year-old distance runner with anorexia OCD, attention deficit disorder, um, severe weight suppression, bradycardia, low vitamin D, low testosterone, and osteoporosis. Uh, uh, referred for non uh, uh, or no progress in outpatient treatment, a 22-year-old college student with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, social skills problems, attention problems, eating only vegetables and supplements, compulsively exercising, and a weight loss of 40 pounds with a BMI of 18, rigid eating, depression, bradycardia, and osteopenia. And and finally, a 40-year-old diabetic with a 10-year history of binge eating, binge drinking, and omitting insulin, multiple medical complications. So um, we talked about, again, the effect of sport in these young athletes. The eating disorder eventually begins to affect the athlete physically and psychologically. Uh, the VO2 max and running speed decrease after a period of dieting and inadequate carbohydrate leads to glycogen depletion, hypoglycemia, fatigue. Uh, inadequate protein um, can, remember, lead to muscle wasting, especially in males, reducing their strength and, uh, and inability to repair, leading to uh, increased risk of injuries. And then dehydration is so common, leading to fatigue, dizziness, and earlier uh, depletion. Um, so um, athletes really need to be in a more intensive treatment or certainly not involved in training until their eating disorder is under under control. Uh, the malnutrition will have a significant impact on their thinking and their concentration. The adult men in particular um, are showing up with many of the co-occurring medical or mental health conditions that occur with eating disorders. So the typical pattern of comorbidities we see in females is also see, seen in males, including anxiety, depression, OCD, and bipolar. Uh, but don't forget that the post that post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, significant. Uh, what, uh, many of the men that come to treatment with us report having had treatment for their uh, comorbid condition first. Uh, it's important also to watch for an increase in substance abuse. Men are more at risk for binge eating, stimulant abuse, and marijuana use. Uh, and uh, this can complicate treatment and warrant um, more of a 24-hour kind of supervision during care. So we talked earlier about the uh, peak bone mass being obtained between ages of 13 and 17 with low testosterone and um, weight loss being associated with the increased risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. Uh, we recommend that uh, first, in first in the morning testosterone level be checked um, uh, on initial evaluation. Uh, men don't lose their menses and so it's sometimes hard to to uh, tell when there's when there's any kind of endocrine suppression, and that can be very helpful. Uh, any testosterone level less than 200 would be considered abnormal and evidence of um, an eating disorder effect. And that uh, most agree that a DEXA screening should be established with the uh, disease lasting any longer than six to 12 months. Uh, uh, Ravi, Ravoni uh, in 2014 uh, actually was looking at mortality across eating disorder um, medical uh, complications and uh, it looks like men have at least as high of a mortality so this uh, uh, assessment of medical complications is very important. 
outpatient treating treatment for men is again the the standard uh, to start, uh, but of course it's important to do a, a thorough medical screening, including that physical exam and labs, EKG, weight, and nutritional assessment. Uh, the meal exposures, uh, focusing on regular meals and snacks, introducing variety, and in particular addressing social eating, boys especially <coughs> um, who are shy or might have a lack of confidence and poor body image tend to become isolated and uh, restoring social eating is very important as well as uh, weight restoring to a natural body weight, taking into account body composition. So weight restoration in males um, tends to um, be to a BMI of 21 to 24 and really varies based on family history and um, uh, early uh, growth curve and body composition and, and sport training. Body image exposures are also important, um, including working on uh, reducing the body checking and um, uh, reducing the discomfort in their, in their body. Um, if there's muscle dysmorphia, uh, some cognitive behavioral strategies uh, to work on that body dysmorphia. So in uh, general, men are equally responsive to psychotherapy uh, and often uh, uh, very responsive to CBT, DBT, and interpersonal psychotherapy. Uh, the medications that we use to treat eating disorders in Females, particularly those that target binge eating, um, seem, at least with preliminary evidence, to also be effective in males. And again, uh, education and increasing family uh, support and peer support are so important, especially because of the increased stigma. Um, so when we are weight restoring, um, uh, and remember, athletes are going to need a higher BMI at target. Uh, you, it's important to not only achieve a normal testosterone, typically greater than 240, uh, but also uh, looking at mindset is important, important. Their commitment to eating, accepting their target weight, and being able to uh, commit to a sustainable eating strategy. Remember that atypical antipsychotics might suppress the testosterone levels, so um, that needs to be taken into account. Um, other aspects of treatment, you know, in a more intensive care groups or individual sessions should address that gender, um, uh, uh, address the male gender concerns across spectrum and help explore identity. Um, there should be opportunity for single gender groups, and if they are in an intensive uh, setting, the whole team should be aware of the special pressures and stigma males might experience. Uh, what we have learned working in, with males in partial and residential care over the last 10 years in partial and last couple of years in residential care. Um, we have had about 58% of our uh, admissions uh, of males have anorexia, about 18% bulimia, about 9% OSFED, 5% with very high weight binge eating disorder, and 10% avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. We've seen that um, substance abuse is common uh, in our population, 25% uh, met crit clear criteria of the males uh, for substance abuse, while our females were less than 15%, and anxiety disorder, OCD, and uh, depression were very, very high at 63% uh, for anxiety. 48% for depression. Uh, the length of stay for males was very similar. Uh, the average length of illness prior to coming in was somewhat less than our population, but still at seven years. Uh, and the mean and made age at admission was 23. Uh, but the best news is that the males responded very well to specialized treatment. Um, uh, most uh, making it to full weight target prior to discharge and uh, remaining there at uh, 
one, three, and 12 months, um, and uh, having significant drops in EDEQ scores and, uh, and uh, FC scores. Um, <coughs> excuse me, for instance, EDEQs dropping from in the high fours to the mid twos, and FCs dropping from 72 to 38, which is a significant clinical Im improvement in body acceptance. And, um, the drive for thinness and uh, binge urges. So uh, the take home from that is that men are responsive to intensive treatment. Um, and I think um, uh, some men prefer to have a males only unit, but certain modifications uh, and uh, staff training and addressing and making sure that groups are relevant uh, for uh, all genders make a big difference in terms of males uh, benefiting from treatment. Uh, the take home is that, remember, there's still stigma. Uh, males often go undetected uh, that they have a high risk of medical complications, so it's really important uh, that males also receive a full assessment. There's a higher risk of eating disorders in athletes, an increased risk of binge purge behavior in those who suffered abuse, an increased risk in the gay population and in those with gender identity struggles, uh, typical comorbidities in, um, uh, are seen in males, including an increased risk of substance abuse, and then males respond to treatment well. Uh, and in addition, we don't forget that males should have the typical screening, it's testosterone levels and vitamin D and DEXA scan. Uh, and finally, I just want to make a plug that we need more research. Um, we've come a long way, but there's still more, uh, more to do. Uh, and I will, um, the last slide, and of course I apologize, I'm not sure what happened, but we'll make sure everyone gets the slides. Uh, Males with Eating Disorders um, by Arnold Anderson, 1990, is a good book. Uh, Making Weight, Men's Conflicts with Eating Dis or with Food, Weight, Shape, and Appearance by um, Arnold Anderson, um, Lee Cohen, and Tom Holbrook is another good book that explores men with eating disorders. Uh, Fit to Die. Um, uh, by Anna Patterson about men and eating disorders, and then um, Named Inc., which is um, a uh, web resource in addition, of course, to ED Hope and Vita are all wonderful resources. So um, I can break now and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum. That was a wonderful and very informative presentation. And we were able to um, upload your PowerPoint to for all the attendees. So if you have not seen that yet, it should be in your control panel. And if you have any trouble, um, we will be emailing it out as well with a copy of this recording. So thank you so much. And we do have a few questions uh, from our from our attendees. And if if Great. you're listening to this still and would like to ask any questions, feel free to submit them via your question pane in your control panel. So first question, Dr. McCallum, um, our, one of our attendees is wondering if you can comment on your experience with male anorexic athletes with low testosterone, specifically any guidelines at what weight, or I'm sorry, at what weight level low testosterone returns to within normal limits? Um, is extra weight gain beyond pre-morbid weight necessary for restart? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I can tell you from my experience what we've seen. Uh, sometimes weight gain beyond where you were before you got sick is important. And that might be due to a change in body composition since uh, 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 body composition can affect um, natural hormone production. And so uh, uh, increasing weight to usually above a BMI of 21, but you know it really depends on the growth curve of the uh, person who's affected. And uh, uh, at some point, if, if mindset is good and eating is stable and there's no bradycardia, or hypotension, then we would uh, 
uh, recommend considering uh, adding testosterone supplements. Great, thank you. And then just a, another part of this question is wondering um, if supplementation is used, are there particular risks or difficulties with this population? So, um, you know, certain supplements will increase pulse or lead to dehydration or just aren't tested or in high doses can cause liver toxicity. So there's a lot of um, uh, variability um, uh, in that. So, uh, uh, and there's so many different supplements, it's hard to know which one. So what I would recommend is, is that the, uh, if someone is using frequent supplements to take them to their uh, uh, primary care doc and make sure that there's not an increased risk of uh, toxicity. Uh, that one case I talked about who, you know, he was using supplements and he was basically avoiding fats. And fats are important for absorption of vitamins. So when he came in, he had all kinds of vitamin deficiencies, but he also had a terrible hand, um, um, he, ha he had sores on his hands that um, his dermatologist couldn't figure out what it was, but when we tested him for essential fatty acid deficiency, that's what it was. So we were able to um, correct that with a, with a uh, healing supplement. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the take home with that is that it's really important if your weight is suppressed and if you are not eating uh, natural food to make sure that you're not that, that you're getting enough uh, carbs, protein, and fats, and that you're getting all of your essential vitamins, and fatty, fatty acids, and, and amino acids. Thank you, Dr. McCallum. We have a couple questions. Um, another question here, are there any differences in the treatment for males versus females with eating disorders? Well, I think that in general, the treatment is similar, but for males, you have to understand the particular medical complications, how to set weight targets, um, um, uh, particular aspects of uh, male cultures, your group treatment. You know, at our center, uh, group treatment is um, all of our therapists and staff have been trained to make sure that our groups are all relevant across gender. So, you know, we're um, talking about sexuality across uh, uh, gender identity and gender preference um, and uh, uh, body image uh, variability. Uh, I think that it is useful for many men to have uh, single gender groups. Uh, although in our treatment center, center we are uh, treating um, uh, some patients who are who are gender queer or even gender confused, and so that can create um, complications, right? And then we have um, uh, uh, separate bathrooms when possible, uh, uh, separate sleeping situations, and uh, some programs are set um, aside to work with males in an all-male setting. Uh, males that choose to come to our treatment center um, uh, do very well in our treatment, so um, uh, that's great, but I think that there's a selection bias, right, that some would uh, choose to go to a males only, and those are definitely worth looking at. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum. And another question is, what types of research would you like to see in regards to men with eating disorders? Ah, well, you know, I'm very interested in this endocrine suppression. Uh, and, you know, we know that in males, adult males who don't have eating disorders, suppressed testosterone can lead to depression and cognitive decline. So really looking at uh, medical complications in males and um, how they might help. I'm also interested in how we might really limit them, uh, both in the short run and prevent enduring kinds of problems. Uh, I'm uh, interested in um, uh, variation in psychotherapy uh, strategies. You know, um, 
there is this, uh, uh, although many males are very competent in terms of uh, emotion, um, uh, describing emotion and managing emotion, uh, it is the sort of common belief that there's more of a struggle with that. So you might uh, predict that interpersonal and, and um, uh, CBT would be more palatable. So just really looking at variations in therapy that might uh, work better. Uh, I'm, you know, we, I've had a number of males uh, come into treatment after uh, treating their attention deficit disorder with a stimulant. Um, and uh, uh, we also have had about 10 cases of onset of an eating disorder after a concussion. And so I'm really curious about what, what's happening there biologically. Uh, we know that the concussion and the, uh, the stress related to that and depression may put them at risk, but is there something else going on? Um, uh, I think we need to understand more about avoidant restrictive food intake disorder and some of the sensory problems that are underlie it as well as um, uh, you know learning new strategies developing new treatments to introduce foods uh, and I you know we need to understand more about food supplements the good the bad and the ugly you know uh, all aspects so um, I think there's just a lot to learn and we need to learn what the barriers are for uh, for doctors and other professionals in identifying males early uh, to reduce their mortality and to help them get effective early treatment. Thank you so much for your insight on that. Um, another question from one of our attendees is wondering, what do you look for to document endocrine suppression? Ah, uh, good question. So, um, you know, uh, growth retardation or uh, suppressed testosterone are two big uh, red flags. So, uh, so if um, say they they were on a growth trajectory to be uh, <coughs> five foot eleven uh, at by age seventeen, and now they are coming to you at five foot six you know, at age 17, and I've had several cases like that. That's a sign that there's endocrine suppression. Or, uh, you know, on the screen with the low testosterone. There are other signs that are less um, specific, such as no sex drive or, you know, la uh, um, fewer sex or less development of secondary sex characteristics. You can also see uh, uh, thyroid suppression, although that you know will will just look like a a, a slight hypothyroid that is uh, <coughs> um, you know related to the malnutrition. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum. And one final question: Have you seen any difference in relapse rate of eating disorders in men versus women? We haven't yet, and our data um, from our treatment center, from those who have come in for this, high, you know, what I call high-dose intensive treatment, uh, suggests that men may do slightly better. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's too early to tell. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum. And that concludes our question and answer period. And would you mind sharing um, maybe just a little bit information about the Callum Place and where any interested individuals might be able to learn more about your organization, just in conclusion? Sure. So our website, mccallumplace.com, M-C-C-A-L-L-U-M, place.com. Um, has a lot of uh, resources as well as describes our programs, but in general we have um, the continuum of care at our uh, mothership program in St. Louis. So from, um, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, outpatient or intensive outpatient to residential care uh, with specialized programs for adolescents and for young adults and then for older adults. And we treat uh, males and females and transgender. Um, 
patients uh, in in uh, Columbia, Missouri, and in Kansas City, Kansas, we have a partial hospital where we also offer uh, intensive treatment for males and females, um, adolescents and adults. We also have a special <coughs> program for elite athletes with eating disorders, and so you know we're really working to try to um, assess whether it's safe for athletes to return to sport and build on the positive aspect of sport identity, as well as make sure that um, our athletes are safe um, in their sport. So um, uh, we we have several several different programs relevant for males. Uh, also, we uh, will treat avoidant restrictive food intake disorder and treat uh, uh, teenagers uh, and preteens down to age 10. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum, and thank you again for this wonderful presentation on this very important topic. We just really appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you again for being here with us today. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure, and I'm so sorry about my slides. If it, you know, I if anyone needs a copy and it's not available, I'm happy to make sure everyone gets a copy. Thank you so much. It's no problem at all. And again, for all of our attendees who are listening, we will be sending out a copy of today's recording along with a copy of Dr. McCallum's PowerPoint if you have not already been able to access it. So thank you for making that available, Dr. McCallum. And for our attendees who are listening, we just really appreciate you joining us. Feel free to visit us at Eating Disorder Hope. Dot com for additional resources as well as an upcoming schedule for our webinar. So on behalf of Dr. McCallum and McCallum Place and Eating Disorder Hope, thank you again for being with us today and have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.